Okay, so we're going to talk about Chapter 12 today and probably a little bit on Monday. That's like all. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about is math spec, but I am going to go over a little bit of IR so that you know what I expect you to do on the test. Okay, so hopefully we'll all be on the same page. Okay, so I want you to tell me how IR spectroscopy works. Tried real hard to make it easy. Just let you know. <laughs> yes, it's B. Okay. Okay, what is A? Does anybody know? We haven't talked about it yet. It's UV vis. UV vis is exciting electrons to different energy levels. Stretching bonds is IR. Okay, this was the, the big clue right there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, using an electron beam to break molecules into different size pieces is mass spec. We're going to talk about today. And flipping nuclei is NMR, all that we talked about. And E is for all of the above. <laughs> How's that? Okay, so you have a slide that looks like that, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I can't draw on this thing, but I really wanted to use it. You'll see why when we do that. The um, so what I did was I drew one on the board, okay? And what I want to do is we're going to go from left to right across the IR, and you're going to tell me what comes from the regions and what they look like. A lot of times what something looks like really helps you to figure out that it's there. So like what comes here? Around 3,500 in your IR. Do you know? Alcohols, okay, and what do they look like? There's something special about what they look like that everybody wants an alcohol on their front. What? No, no, but that's another one. What? What? They're broad. They're broad and they look like a thumb. That's the OH, okay? What's in there? Do you know how to? Oh, you're on the deal. Okay. What else comes in this region besides the OH? Hmm? Amines. Okay. And amines look different from OHs. Even though they're in the same region, they have a different look to them. What do they look like? Yeah. The rabbit ears. The rabbit, the bunny ears, okay? If you have an NH2, it'll look like bunny ears. If you only have one NH, it'll still be sharper. I probably made that a little too sharp. Okay, all right. I now messed up my deal. Right, I'll put it like that. How's that? Okay. There's something else that comes around 3,300. Isn't that one? Comes at 3,300. Here, we're going to another color. Alkyl. Yes, and it's something up special about the alkyl. It's not just an alkyl. It's the, right, the acetylenic CH comes at 3,300. All right, now I'm going to have to write on top of that. All right, let's see if I can't make this work. So you can take a picture of it. I'm going to write S-P-C-H, okay? If you have a triple bond that doesn't have an acetylenic hydrogen, you don't get a peak. You can still have a triple bond, just doesn't have a hydrogen. This is the H. 
And it's pretty sharp and it's pretty unique to alkynes. Okay? Then comes your 3000 line. Okay, so here's my, I may have to rearrange my scale. It's not. Okay, here's my 3000 line. Okay, what comes to the left and right of 3,000? What? No. I mean, they're there too, but we're going to throw them on here in a minute. Okay, right at 3,000 is your CHs. Left is SP2CH and right is SP3CH. Okay, so I'll go, and they can vary depending on how many there are, whether they're gonna be really big, all that good stuff. So this is SP3CH, and over here is SP2CH. CHs on benzene rings are SP2CHs, okay? Okay, now the whole, um, there's like a lot in this, like this area right here, you get a lot. Okay, now the last one is the carboxylic acid. The thing about carboxylic acids is that OH of the carboxyl group can go across the 3000 line. So oftentimes they'll look like this. Okay, they can even be super big. Okay, and your little CHs usually show up, but they'll show up so like, is they'll show up at the bottom of that. You'll see the little CHs now, okay? So this is your, I don't know if this is gonna work. Okay, the thing is, this looks very different from a regular L. Okay, looks very different from a regular L. Because it's these big blocky, <coughs> they're huge. All right, then we get over in here. There's something in the high 2000 range that isn't something that you see very much. That's C triple bond C and C triple bond A. Okay, and those are little. They're little. Okay, you're probably not really going to run into them much, but if you have this, the purple SPCH, you need to be looking for that, okay? If you have an internal triple bond, a lot of times there's not enough of a change in dipole moment, and so you don't get a peak for the triple bond. Okay, so it's not unusual to not have a peak for a triple bond and have a triple bond, okay? So it can be very difficult to tell an internal alkyne apart from an alkane, okay? What would we do? We would do something else. Okay, we do enamine. We do other things too. Okay, the main thing that we use IR for is functional group identification. Okay, I'm not going to give you an IR and expect you to look at that and draw the structure like I do for enamine. Okay, this is different. Okay, most of the time as scientists and chemists, we use them together. They work together. Okay. All right, now, 1700 is the next big thing. What do we get from 1700? Right at 1700. Let's see if I can't make my peaks and my numbers match. What's that? Carbonyls. Okay, this is one to know. Carbonyls. Carbonyls are big. They're typically the biggest peak in the spectrum. They should it's like punch in the nose, okay? National. Yeah, pretty much. Um, if you have multiple ones, sometimes it might not look as sharp because they're right by each other. If you have multiple carbonyls in it. Okay, now there are different kinds of carbonyl compounds. One that we already mentioned is the acids, right? Okay, so if you have this, you should also have this to go with it. If you have the thing of the carboxylic acid, you should have this to go with it. 
if you have this and you don't have this, something wrong. Okay? Or you're confused. Or the instrument's broke. Like seriously. Or you don't take it. Okay, now what's another kind of carbonyl compound? You can have the size of carbon so You could have a what? Hmm? A what? A ketone. Okay. Ketones have no other discerning factor. They would only have this. Okay. So you have to decide ketone by getting rid of all the other ones. Okay. So what's another one that you could have? Ketone, carboxylic acid, what else? Aldehyde. Aldehyde. Okay. Aldehydes have the little show, right? They have this, okay? That CH is special. Now, do you know where that comes? Boy, my picture really is a jack. <coughs> I don't know if this is gonna work. I needed this part to be really big and then this part to be small. Maybe that's what I should, okay? All right, so. What happens with aldehydes is you typically get a double peak at 2700, 2800, 2750, 2850. They're right in that area. You usually get a double peak. They're not super big. Okay, this is the aldehyde. So if you have a carbonyl, you know, you don't have a carboxylic acid. Okay, so you're trying to decide between aldehyde and ketone. You look for this. Okay, 2700, 2800. Okay, there's one other kind of carbonyl compound you can have. It's a ester. Okay, what do esters have? A C what? A CO. Now, carboxylic acids have that CO also. Okay, but they're going to have the big OH. Okay, I'm going to show you some. You have some in your notes. Okay, and you're going to uh, decide what's functional groups. Okay, so hopefully that'll clarify some of this. All right, so where do COs come? Around what? Yeah, around 1,300. They're typically big. Okay. Yeah, see, because now I don't have any. Okay, now, there are other things. There's CNs. There's C double bond S. There's a lot of little things, but most of them start coming way down here. Okay, and what was this reach area called when you get below 1,000? A special name for that area. Yeah, the fingerprint region. It's hard in the fingerprint region to come up with specific things. Now you might have, did you talk about double bonds? Where were they? I should put them up here. Where do double bonds come? C double bond C. Yeah, right around 1600 is C double bond C. That's a number I remember. I usually remember 1700 carbonyl. Yes, if the carbonyls are esters versus carboxylic acids versus ketones, they're going to be smoothed a little bit, but typically you don't have to know all those numbers. Okay? Your double bonds for uh, benzene rings are right around here. There's stuff about, well, if you have a T butyl group, you're going to get. Okay? If you were making something and you got a T butyl group, and you wanted to find it, then you look for it. But you're not going to decide that you have a T-butyl group by your IR. You're going to decide it by your animal. Okay? So remember that all these things get used together. Okay? Does this help at all? Does this help at all? A little? I feel like this picture looks like a person's age. Okay. All right. Here is another way to look at them. Um, this just, this has nothing to do with the, how they look or like SP3, SP2, SP CHs. Okay. It doesn't have any of that in there. It also doesn't have the carboxylic acids. And then here you have, um, double bonds, carb, carbon, carbon, carbonyl, carbon, double bond, nitrogen. Carbonyls are always bigger than the other. <laughs> because there's more of a difference in electronegativity. That's how calm. So you can really stretch your bonds. 
Did y'all stretch bonds and vibrate and translate? I talked to Jay, didn't he? I did a little bit of it. Okay, okay, good. He didn't make y'all stand up and do them though, did he? No, I do. Okay, so this will this isn't in your pre-slides. I found it later and I said, well, I already posted them. But it'll be in your complete slides. Okay. So if that if you think that helps you. Okay. Oh, it's 2200. I might have been a little off on that. It's that region where nothing comes. Okay. All right. So now here is an IR. Okay? You got this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. So when you look at that, what's the first thing you see? Uh, okay, good. Okay. What else can you tell me about it? Anything else? Let me ask you this. Do you think there's a bending ring in it? There was a bending ring in it. What would you see? There would be stuff to the left of 3000. Right is SP3, left is SP2, it's numerical order. SP, SP2, SP3, isn't that nice? <coughs> okay, the universe did something good. Okay, is there, is there a carbonyl? No. Is there a double bond? That's 1600, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's an alcohol. Okay, so what I like to do is I draw my 3,000 line, and those are your SP3CH. This is your OH of alcohol, which you got right off. Okay. What does that do? Oh, the CO. I have the CO in there. Remember, you're going to get a CO from an alcohol. You're going to get a CO from a carboxylic acid. But this is really what's going to take. Okay. Okay, this happens to be two hexanol. You see that it has no unsaturation in it. Okay, it's a completely saturated alcohol. Remember what saturated means? Like all the hydrogens are in it. Okay, you couldn't like add more hydrogen to that by reducing it. It's, it's all the way. All right, here's the next one. <coughs> Maybe. All right, what do you think about this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, right here is your carbonyl. Okay, does everybody see that it's not an alcohol? What is this? That little bitty piece. Is that anything to worry about? No. But what it is, is it's an overtone. When you have carbonyl compounds, you typically get an overtone. Anybody musically inclined? play instruments, you learn about harmonics, a little bit of that stuff. Okay, so this one, let's say this is 1720. I don't know the exact number of it. 1720, okay, double 1720, what do you get? 3440, guess what that is? 3440, those are called overtones, okay? You can also half them, go the other way, and sometimes you get a peak there too. Okay, that's just a th weird thing about because we're vibrating the molecule. It's just like vibrating an instrument. Okay, all right, so what else can you tell me about this carbonyl compound? Can you tell me what one it is? Is it a carboxylic acid, an ester, a keto, a me, amide? What? Why do you think it's a keto? Because it has the Right. Thousand, okay. And what does it not have? It does not have the big blocky OH that goes across for carboxylic acids. It does not have NHs. It does not have the aldehyde peaks. Okay, so you rule stuff out to end up a ketone. Okay, and this would also be a saturated ketone. So that's your SP3CH. There's your big old carbonyl, punch you in the nose. Oh, it was 1720. Okay, okay. Ketone carbonyls can range from 1650 to 1800. It depends on their environments, okay? And that is the overtone. 
Okay, so it's two hexanone. This is what it looks like, I think. It's not giving it to me? Why ain't it giving it to me? <coughs> I don't know. Let me let me try this. Is the thing like messed up? We're not going. Don't do that to me. You're gonna mess up the whole room. See, there it is. There's this little picture. Should be where we were. Gonna go to the next slide. Oh, I can't do that. You didn't see that, did you? Because I'm gonna ask you what functional group that is. Nobody saw that, right? Totally not. Okay, all right. So, what can you tell me about this structure? Uh huh. Where is it? What is this? Mm hmm that's your carbonyl. Okay, what is this? <coughs> you see how this is different from the last one? There we have our SP3CH. Remember that when we say to the right of 3,000 and the left of 3,000, it's right there. 3,000 totally divides them, okay? So these over here are too far to be SP3CH. They're too far over. Okay, so there's our carbonyl. We're trying to decide, is it a ketone? Is it a carboxylic acid? Is it an ester? Is it an amide? Okay, these are your aldehyde CH. That's what they look like, okay? The aldehyde CH is the only way to tell the difference between an aldehyde and a ketone. <sighs> this happens to be butyraldehyde. That's its common name. And y'all stink sign. Throw that out there. Some of these little ones, oh, they really smell bad. Okay, this um probably an overtone might be a little wet. Does any did anyone think that that was an OH? No, because what do we know about OHs? They're big, they look like <coughs> it's the huge valley. Okay. All right, let's see if this one works. All right, how about this one? Okay, now this one is from a different NMR, okay? Um, I try to show you a variety of them just so you get used to them. I want you to see that centimeters to the minus one, remember, is your unit. And what does that mean? What is the term for centimeters to the minus one? There's a word that we use for that. Wave number. Yeah, wave number. Okay, it's taking wavelength and taking inverse. Okay, and in centimeters, we're in the infrared region. Okay, so what can you tell me about this one? Do you have any ideas? Uh huh. Do you see how it's going across the 3000 line? Okay, so that also means that you should have what else? What else? If, you, if you think you have a carboxyl group here, what else should you have? What's that? Carbonyl, okay? Okay, so there's my 3000 line. This right here is my SP3CH. Yeah, by the time you write it 10 times, you get it. Okay, this is my carboxyl. This is the OH of the CO2H. And this over here is my carbonyl, okay? Now you should also have a CO, where do you think the CO is? It's something in here, yeah. And um, probably right in the, it's gonna be whichever one is the biggest. Okay, COs are gonna be pretty big. Not as big as a carbonyl, but they're gonna be pretty big. So if you had pointed to that one, I would be happy. Okay, you got in the ring. All right, so this one happens to be two heptanoic acid, and this is what it looks like. Why do I have the two up there? I don't know why the two is there. It shouldn't be there. I'll take it out before I. I don't know if I was started with another name and didn't catch that I changed it. It should just be 
heptanoic acid. You can't have it on carbon two, it's on carbon one. It has to be on the end, right? We'll do that nomenclature later. All right, now, which one of the following molecules gave the IR spectrum below and why? All right, so go down the line and kind of rule stuff out or rule stuff in. It's not the first one, why not? Because it, what has the OH, the molecule or the spectra? The spectra. The spectra. Okay, so does everybody see that? Right here we got a pretty OH. Okay, so that one's gone. Apparently I made it go away without even realizing. Okay. <laughs> Too much motion today. All right, so what about the next one? Does it have an OH? Do you think it's that one? That's three pentanol. What do you think? Hmm. So what things do we have up here to rule stuff out and all that good stuff? Is there anything you could rule out? What? You want to rule out what? The carbonyl. Is there a carbonyl in the 1700 range? No, there are some little peaks though, but carbonyls are always big. Okay. What are these little peaks? Have you seen them before? They're indicative of the new. Get, it's called, I call them the benzene bumps. Okay because there's bumps up there. Okay, sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't. I like, like I wouldn't use them to say, yeah, I definitely have a benzene ring. I'd use them to say, hmm, I should look for a benzene ring. Okay, so what would you look for to look for a benzene ring? Benzene ring peaks, okay, and what else? <laughs> what about 3,000? You're gonna have peaks to the right and peaks to the left. Okay, so you would have SP2C8. So which one do you think is the last one? Apparently I made them all go away. Okay, it didn't, I thought it was going to ride on here. I guess I didn't. Put on it. Okay, so here you've got your line for 3000. This is your OH. This is your SP2CH. This is your SP3CH. These are benzene in here. This is the benzene bumps. And then you probably have a CO. Where do you think the CO is? Pick the big one. Probably that one. That would be the one. Because it's the biggest. Okay. So the CO will vary too because of its proximity to a benzene ring, stuff like that. Okay. So usually you see COs in I don't know, let's see, 900 to 30. There's kind of a little range on that. Just pick the biggest one. That's my advice from years of experience. Okay? Any questions on that? There are probably these sharper ones, and the fact that you have the SP2CH is the left three thousand. Yes. Okay? How did your IRs come out when you ran them? Y'all got like software, we finally got it all working. Like, wow. So y'all be treated with care and kindness. Okay. okay? All right, so mass spec. All right, now the real stuff. Okay, mass spec determines the molecular mass and molecular formula of a compound, okay? And we'll talk about looking at how to figure that out, okay? You're also gonna get some structural features for a mass spec. There are things that are specific, like ketones always do this, and alcohols kind of do that, but you're really gonna get your main functional still, y'all, from I. okay? You can determine some stuff from the mass spec, though, as well. You can determine full structures from the mass spec, okay? Just like IR, like let's say um, you have an unknown IR and you go run it, okay? And you're gonna go compare it to IRs in a book. 
this fingerprint will match on, okay? Well, mass specs will totally match also. They'll match not only how um, the molecule fragmented, but the heights of the peaks and stuff like that will oftentimes match up. So um, if you are comparing, you can do that. A lot of times, like if you work for OSBI, FBI, in some kind of analytical lab, where you are gonna analyze a compound and figure out, is it cocaine, is it methamphetamine? They do it strictly with mass spec. Okay, they don't bother to get the functional. They just go right to the meat, okay? So you would get your mass spec and you would compare it and it'll match right. Okay, and that's what they do like for criminals and in the law and all that stuff to decide if what they got in the bust is methamphetamine or, you know, whatever, okay? And they can also figure out purity, too, doing some of the mass spec stuff, okay? Abby used mass spec all the time in NCIS, okay? Did they actually have database actually? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes, they do. They have really uh, computerized the whole deal, so that's faster, for one thing, okay? Now, other thing about mass spec is it only requires a very small amount of sample. And you'll notice that most of the stuff that we do instrumental methods with though, does not require very much sample. They really work at cleaning up those instruments and getting them so you don't need so much. Originally, NMR took more. Okay, now when you do mass spec, the sample is destroyed in the analysis. So it's really important to only use a very small amount because if you took all of the methamphetamine and put it in the instrument, then you don't have any proof. So that's why uh, they want you, to, they want to use a very small amount because this one actually breaks it up. You could technically get your sample back from the IR. It's not, and it depends on how you, how you put it in the IR. But your NMR, you can get your sample out of the tube. You could pour it back out, roll it back to town, and use it. You have it back. So if you put everything that you made, because you only got 20 milligrams, then they're done that, in your NMR tube, praying that it was right, like I said, lots of prayer, uh, then you could still get it back out of there, okay? So you would rinse it like 50 times with solvent, or that all that, okay? But in a mass spec, you can't do that. Okay. So here is the steps for mass spec, basically. The compound to be analyzed is referred to as the analyze. Okay, you might not have heard that term before. Is vaporized and ionized. Okay, to vaporize it, we do a couple of things. One is we heat it up and we put it under a vacuum. Okay, there are multiple ways that you can put your compound into the mass spec. Okay. I worked with peptides, and so the way that I put mine in was called the DIT method, direct insertion probe. There was this really long tube, and at the very end of this metal tube, I put a little bit of my sink, okay? And then I would put it into the instrument. Now, that tube thing was metal, and it's hooked to the instrument, and it's going to heat up, okay? So, what you have to do is get it all in there and then you start the heating process. So I go in, we have a brand new mass spec. I get to be one of the first graduate students to use the mass spec, trying to follow all the rules, all the directions, you know. And I start and I put my sample in. And you have these little things that you open and then you put it in, kind of like a spaceship, you know, where you got all these things, because out there is the vacuum, right? Well, I'm seeing it all of a sudden the machine goes, Ooh, and it sounds like it's going to take off like a big show. And all these lights start flashing. And oh my gosh, you should have seen my face. I thought, oh my gosh, I just broke. And I had to go get some. And he's like, oh, I broke the back. All we had to do was split the couple switches, and it was all okay. But oh my gosh, y'all. Like my stomach was, yeah, I would not have a game. Okay, so once you get it all in there and you get it heated up, 
then what you're going to do is you're going to hit it with a beam of high energy helix. I do not know what the source of the electrons is. I probably should. But uh, Dr. Smith knows that if you take analytical with him, he'll take it. Okay. And what that energy electrons do is they knock an electron off the electron cloud. The so remember that you've got all these electrons around your molecule, around your atom, and you're going to zap it with a beam of electrons and kick one. Okay, that's going to make what we call a molecular ion because it's now going to have a charge. Okay, that charge is going to be what? If you remove an electron, the charge is positive. Yeah. Okay, okay. Typically, we call that a radical cation. It's going to have an electron and a plus charge. Okay, because you only knock one out. Then that molecular ion will break apart into smaller cations and radicals. What the mass spec detects are cations. That's what the main detector is, okay? Is it only sees cations, right? Got all that? Okay, so here's a little picture of kind of a mass spec. So here's your sample going in the dip. Okay, you can also hook this to something called gas chromatography, which you might have heard a little bit about. When you do gas chromatography, you have a gas and a column and it separates things. My things would not work on that. So I typically, that's why I did the dip, because my things were too high molecular weight. All right, so you put your sample in here. Here's the electron beam zapping it. Okay, and then it goes to this magnet. The magnet separates it by the molecular Okay, so everything you're gonna see is gonna be mass numbers. Okay, it comes out and then you have your little detector and um, you get your little recorder, which used to be literally a recorder, but then they moved the whole thing to computers. Okay, and over here it says deflected according to M over Z. M over Z is mass to charge ratio. Z is charge. I don't know if you run into that little symbol. It doesn't get used that much a little bit. You, you might have been mentioned in journal chem a little bit that Z stood for charge once. Okay, mass to charge ratio. The charge is almost always plus one. If you had a mass and the charge ratio was two, <coughs> that changes things. But in mass spec, it's always one. Okay, just live with it. We are like, we can divide by one. We are good. Okay. So this is going to separate it by its mass. Okay. So that's going to get you these pictures. Oh, it's that, that said only, only um, positive things get detected is what that said. All right. But, which you probably already wrote down. Okay. So mass spectrometry works by. <laughs> I'm trying to get you excited, like the electron in the energy beam. Then we'll all break apart. Okay, I got 11. Do I have 12? I think I'm supposed to have 12. Can I not count? Is somebody's not working? We got it. We got it. <clears throat> it I don't know. I, I think I'm only supposed to have 12. I think it works. It just took a minute. Okay, yep, it's a D. We're going to use an electron beam to break a molecule into different size pieces. Okay, you're knocking an electron off and then it just starts falling apart. Okay. Okay, so here's what a simple spectrum work, looks like. Okay, we'll talk about different aspects of that spectrum. Okay, this is pentane. Plain old pentane. Boring pentane. Okay, and you actually get a P for every specific mass number. Okay, so remember when you look at the periodic table, what's the weight of carbon? 12.01. 
okay? Why is it 12.01? Because there is carbon 12, and there's carbon 13, and there's carbon, right, okay? There is 1.11% of all carbon in the world is carbon 13, okay? So you're gonna have mainly carbon 12. Okay, this is going to detect between those different isotopes. You're going to get a peak for the thing with carbon 12 and the peak for the thing with carbon 13. But the peak for the thing with carbon 13 is probably only going to be 1% the height of the other one. Okay, does that make sense? That's why you have all these and they're all whole numbers. Okay, that's why you have all those peaks. It looks like a lot. It's because of the different isotopes. Now, what about hydrogen? Hydrogen is typically hydrogen one, right? But there's also some deuterium, okay? So you see how we're getting all the different peaks, okay? All right, so here is the tallest peak. The tallest peak in the spectrum is called the base, okay? And you'll notice over here it says relative abundance. That is the abundance of that peak as it comes through the detector. So this compound gives you a lovely peak at 43. That's your biggest peak. It is 100%, and everything else is a ratio to that one. Okay? So you can't look at this and go, oh, that means I have three methyls. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Okay, now over here, typically you're normal decent sized peak to the right is your molecular ion. There are compounds that will break apart so easily that you don't get the molecular ion. You can mess with your conditions in the mass spec to try to get uh, a molecular ion to show up, okay? So you can lower your heat, you can, you know, do stuff like that, okay? So that's your molecular ion, that's 72. Okay, now over here I have written N minus 15. Well, actually, the book. N minus 15. So if I look at this compound, once I drop, a, kick an electron out, and I get my radical P ion, okay, something's going to break apart. What do you think 15 is? 15 is a methyl group. 12 plus 3 is 15. One of you whole numbers. Okay, so this is losing a methyl group. Okay, how do I get the peak 43? What do I lose? What's 29? An ethyl. Okay, if I lose an ethyl, I get 43. Okay, what's the whole molecular weight of this? One, two, three, four, five. Five times 12 is? Six. Sixty plus three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, what is sixty plus twelve? Seventy-two. So you can actually use whole numbers like that. Okay. What do you think this peak is at twenty-nine? That's probably from an ethyl. It's not as big as the peak at forty-three, which is the propyl. Okay, it has to do with how, just how the thing breaks apart. We're not going to try to come up with something for every peak, just like we don't do that in the IR. Why didn't my phone ding it? I was telling you I have a meeting in 15 minutes. I ain't going to worry about that. <laughs> All right, so here is the electron beam hitting the pentane molecule. We get a molecular ion. Here it is, M over Z is 72. Notice the charge is plus one, okay? And we knocked an electron off. We don't worry about those electrons. I don't even know where they go, okay? What does that do? That then starts to fall apart. Okay, here we have an ethyl falling off and you got a propyl. Remember that what you're detecting in the mass spec is the cation. When it falls apart, you get a free radical and a cation. You get a cation and a free radical. It can fall apart either way. Which one's more stable? Well, probably the propyl because it's got more stuff to help stabilize it. All that normal stuff still fits. If you have a T-butyl group, you're going to get a big T-butyl cation, just like you do in mechanisms. Okay? 
Don't worry about drawing arrows to show how all these things fall apart. Just cut it with your pencil, okay? And go here, notice what we lost, 15, that's the 57, okay? And you're probably gonna see the 15. Now there's other little peaks in there, don't worry about all that. Okay, is this kind of sinking in? It takes some gotten used to. All right, so look at this one, okay? This is 2-methylbutane, okay? It is an isomer of that pentane that was on the other one, right? Okay, notice that our molecular ion is still 72. Okay, what do you think this 57 is? And look how much bigger it is than it was on the last slide. Two slides ago. Okay, why do you think it's bigger? Because what is 72 minus 57? What did we lose? A methyl. So where did we lose it? Look, boom, boom, boom. We now have three chances to lose a methyl. Okay, so as you branch your molecule, the ratios of those peaks are going to change. This is how they use mass spec to figure out what the structure is. They would compare this, okay? 43, what is 43, you think? <coughs> what? We lost 72 minus 43 is 29. We lost an ethyl, where do you think we lost it? <coughs> All right, I mean, I didn't want to erase that. I'll tell you what, maybe I can write over here. Okay, so here's my compound. Okay, so where do you think I lost the um, ethyl? Right here. Okay, so this is what kind of carbocation? Secondary. Isn't that more stable? Okay, so it's going to break here to get the big peak at 40. That's sinking in at all. Okay, now when you see something like this, and I got a minute, um, you should be able to figure out what the structure is, okay, or what the formula is. Okay, and I'll show you how to do that uh, next time. Okay, that kind of gets you going. <laughs> Just basically cut stuff and figure out ways. That's basically what you're doing.